What is New Covenant Theology? At its heart, it is God's plan of redemption for man. This is a teaching on how God has always pursued us. Before you ever found Jesus, He found you. And before you ever pursued Jesus, He pursued you. And before you ever had a plan to get your life right, He had a plan to get your life right. Because that's the love of God. There's this eternal quest of God to know you and to walk with you. God's Eternal Pursuit. Welcome uh, to our teaching series on God's Eternal Pursuit. Uh, here at World Challenge. We're so glad that you could be with us. This is going to be a five-week series, and today is our starting day, so thank you for uh, being here. Uh, we have some of our World Challenge family that's in. We're doing a Bible study. At the end, we're going to have some questions uh, that they'll an uh, ask and give answers to. Uh, you're welcome to stay for that, and uh, we're just so glad to have you. This is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, David Wilkerson, uh, many years ago, uh, wrote a book called New Covenant Unveiled, uh, we kind of renamed it. It's still the same book, but it's called It Is Finished. Uh, I would encourage you to go and read it. Uh, but I, in my life in ministry, uh, wound up as a missionary in Ireland. And uh, I met a man named Pastor Carter Common. He was the pastor of Times Square Church. And he was preaching on New Covenant. And I had gone through Bible college. I have a degree in systematic theology. And uh, I found this such a profound teaching and uh, when I just came here to be a part of the leadership team at World Challenge, uh, Gary wanted me to talk about this. I certainly want to talk about this. And uh, I think it's a subject that is defining to World Challenge, and I think it will help people. So if you're here, maybe you have done studies on the New Covenant, and I would say to you, I think that there'll be some revelation and some things that will help you on that journey. If you've never done a study on New Covenant, I think this will be great for you. Uh, it also is in a format that you can use it for Bible studies and, and other things to share out with people. So uh, we are going to just jump in a little bit to let you know uh, the, the, the five weeks. Uh, the first week, which we'll be talking about today, is the weakness of man. The second week is the strength of, of Christ. The third week, we'll talk about a revelation that Paul had on by grace through faith. The fourth week, I believe, is one of those teaching times it's, uh, on the unbreakable covenant. It's the covenant with the Father and the Son. It really will bring, I think, a dynamic understanding of the gospel. And then lastly, our last uh, session will be on the fact that we are more than conquerors in Christ. And I think this will be encouraging to you. But more than anything, this is a Bible study. We are going to be going through the Word. If you have a, a Bible you could get, uh, maybe a piece of paper and a pen and take some notes, uh, we really want to dive into the Word. I will tell you, I gave my life to Christ in jail. Um, I have been serving Him now for about 35 years. And I want to tell you, I love God's Word. I love to study it. I love to know it. I love to embrace it. And so uh, we're excited. God's Word is powerful. And uh, we pray that this will be something that really helps to encourage you in your faith. Well, in Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, most of you or many of you may know the story. In Jeremiah, um, his life, uh, Israel had gone into a lot of sin. They had turned their backs on God. Because of that, the Babylonian uh, army would come and destroy Jerusalem. They would actually burn the rocks. And uh, they took captives to Babylon. They killed a lot of the people that were there. And in the middle of it, um, a, uh, J Jeremiah in chapter 31, verses 31 through th 34 he begins to talk about uh, the covenant that they were living under at that time was a covenant of works. And because they didn't keep covenant, it actually, the scripture says there, and in Hebrews, God says, I turned my back on them because they didn't keep covenant. But then he gave a promise. He says, but there is a day coming that there will be a new covenant. And in that covenant, I will, I will be a God to my people. They will be my people. I will put my law in their hearts and their minds and, he's, and then he says, and their sins I will remember no more. And it's really the basis of this new covenant uh, thinking and ideology that we have. Now, this is what I believe. I believe that the scripture pours this, you know, really brings this out. Um, but Paul, the apostle Paul was the vessel that God used 
to bring this new covenant understanding. Doesn't mean that he's the, you know, the sole person that spoke about it in the New Testament, but he certainly had this incredible revelation of the new covenant. And uh, in my opinion, uh, the Apostle Paul is the greatest missionary that's ever lived. He is the greatest church planter that's ever lived. He is the greatest theologian that's ever lived. And I believe that the basis of that is because one, he had an incredible encounter with Jesus. If you know, he's going to persecute Christians and God, you know, strikes him to the core. He comes to this place and he's blinded and Jesus reveals himself to him. And I love this because this is the difference between having an experience with Jesus and having an encounter. At the end of this time with the Lord, Paul says, Lord, what do you want me to do? And you know, the true reality of when Christ has gotten into your life and you have an encounter with him is, hey, my life is an open book. What do you want to do? My life belongs to you. And so it began Paul on this process of living this life for God. Uh, It says, if you can go to Galatians chapter one, it actually says later in the chapter, he says, he says, when when I had this, um, you know, when I was saved, I didn't go to the apostles. He said he actually spent years just going through and, and experiencing this revelation um, from God. I think that if uh, most of you know, he says he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Uh, he was a man of the word. He probably in his position had the Torah, the first five books of the Bible memorized. I mean, he was a theologian of theologians, but he realized that his understanding was all based on Old Testament scripture and it was based on Jewish uh, ideology. And when he goes to the scriptures, He's going to the scriptures and he has this revelation of Jesus, which is incredible. It brings this idea of the work that Christ came to bring and what the gospel message is. Now, the other, the other disciples and apostles had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Uh, Paul was not there for that. But the revelation that he had was the fullness of the work that Jesus accomplished on the cross. And I believe that that is the foundation of what the new covenant message is. And, you know, I'll do New Covenant series in times with pastors and leaders overseas. I'll, there's times that I'll take 30, 40 sessions and go through New Covenant. This is going to be an introduction to New Covenant. It, hopefully, it's going to help you in your spiritual walk. But here you go in Galatians chapter 1 and verses 6, uh, six through 8. It brings this, um, this incredible uh, understanding of what Paul had. Now, look, look at this with me. He's speaking to the Galatians. Uh, the Galatians, the Galatian church at this time was mixing the grace of God uh, together with the law. So they were trying to mix old covenant and new covenant together. And Paul has this revelation of going, you don't mix grace and law. Uh, if, you, if you try to do that, you don't, you don't bring power to grace. What you do is you nullify the power of what it means to live by grace through faith, which is our third session. I really make sure that you go through that. It nullifies the power when you try to synchronize by grace through faith with Old Testament law. And so he's writing this to them in verse 6, and he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. The different gospel was mixing the grace of God to old uh, old covenant teaching, which is not another gospel at all. But there are some who trouble you, who want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that, than that what we have preached, let him be accursed. And those are really strong words, but they're strong words because he had an encounter with Jesus, but then he has this revelation of how, why Jesus came, what he accomplished. And when he saw old covenant being propagated, uh, in, in the church, he was like, hey, this is a wrong message. Get back to the power of God that comes by grace through faith. And he was so passionate about it. As a matter of fact, he was so, so passionate about it that if you read through the entire chapter, he calls out Paul and chap- or Peter in chapter 2, and he has a face-to-face confrontation with, with, with Peter because Peter was trying to insert law back into the church in Galatia. He's like, hey, we'll have none of this. It is only by the grace of God. No flesh will ever be justified by the works of the law, but only by faith and grace. And so it's really important that we have this understanding. And you know, unfortunately, uh, being a a pastor and uh, been in a lot of places around the world in different countries, 
And unfortunately, much of the, the truth uh, of, of this message has been diluted in the body of Christ. And if only you know, 30 or 40 years after the resurrection of Christ that Paul is dealing with these issues in the church in Galatia, I believe that there's still some of these issues that still linger in the church today. So it's really important that we have a precision understanding of the message that Paul brought, the message of the new covenant, and why it is, it, why it is very distinct from the old covenant. It's really important that we have this understanding. And you know, when you look at the life of Paul, what a great man of God. Uh, he's, you know, I love Jesus with all my heart. He is first and foremost my hero. Right behind that is Paul. And one of the reasons I think that I love Paul so much uh, in his writings is because Jesus is the, the son of God. So he certainly endured temptations and he overcame them. But when Paul talks, he says, I was the chiefest of sinners. And you know, the places that I came from, I was kind of a chief of sinners. <laughs> now, mine was partying and drinking and drugs and living life for myself and selfishness and all of those things. Paul, his sin was spiritual pride. I want to just tell you today, when Jesus begins to come in your life, whether it's spiritual pride or whether it's partying or, you know, whatever the issues may be, when you have this revelation of the holiness and the goodness of God, it begins to show you we're probably all in our mind and our understanding the chiefest of sinners. But Paul comes from this place and, and he, he was wrapped up in spiritual pride. Uh, he was living, you know, in this way where, I mean, he's persecuting and killing Christians. But when he has an encounter with Jesus and he has the revelation of the word, if you read in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he lists all of the things that he endured. He says, I was beaten, you know, uh, three times with rods. I was, I was uh, whipped with cords five times. I'm just going to tell you, after the second time that I've been whipped with cords, I'm going to figure, how do I get out of that? <laughs> and yet he kept going back into those situations. At one point, he says, I was stoned. You know, he was stoned to death. He goes and preaches the gospel in a, in a city. They stone him to death. After he is stoned to death, he gets back up. He, you know, it, it appears that he's raised from the dead. And you think that he runs to the next city or finds a safe place or cleans it. He goes right back to the same place with the same people that stoned him. And you go, man, either this dude is just crazy or there is something that drives him. And I want you to see this today. What is it that drove the Apostle Paul? I believe was two things. He had an encounter with Jesus, and he wanted other people to have an encounter with Jesus. The second part to that was he knew what it was to live under law, and he knew that it was a broken, dead, empty place. And when he came to this understanding of the new covenant in Christ, it so motivated him that he wanted to tell the whole world, and he did, most of the known world, he planted churches and preached the gospel. It wasn't so he would have a great name. He did it because he was so impassioned to take the message of the new covenant and the revelation of what Christ accomplished at the, at, the, at the cross, and he wanted to tell the whole world. I pray that the church in the day that we live in has a fresh revelation of the new covenant because when we have that and we see the purposes of God, and we begin to work. That is when the church will rise in power and authority the way that God has called us to do. So today we're going to focus on the weakness of man. And if you would, I want you to go back to Genesis, because the first covenant in the Bible is a covenant uh, between God and Adam. Now, um, this is um, highlighted in the scripture. A covenant, just very quickly, is an agreement between two parties. And what you have here is an agreement between uh, Adam and God. And the agreement that God makes is he says, I will protect you, I will provide for you, and my presence will be with you. Every day he goes and enjoys the presence of God. But Adam had his part to keep as well. And the part that he had to keep was one simple rule. It was one law. He had one law to keep, and he could not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Some people say it was an apple. If it were me, it would need to be a pear because I like pears more than apples. However, I don't think that it had anything to do with what kind of fruit was on the tree. The, the essence of the temptation was this, is that when the enemy came, he said this, that as soon as you eat of this, tree, this fruit from the, the, the tree of good and evil, that now 
God doesn't make the rules. You can make the rules. It's not God's destiny. It's your destiny. God doesn't determine what's right and what's wrong. Hey, Adam, you can determine what's right and what's wrong. And you know that temptation is still valid today. But I think to myself, if I were in the garden, now God places him in a perfect place. I mean, it's the Garden of Eden. So he has everything, protection, provision, all of it is there. Uh, he has a perfect wife. So when, uh, you know, when she cooks a pot roast, it is a perfect pot roast, right? Uh, it is to the T, amazing. The vegetables were the best. The steaks were the most tender. I mean, it was a perfect world. There was no mean neighbors. There was no people to cut you off in traffic. There was no internet. There were like there was no neighbors to compare yourself with, or you know, Facebook to kind of look and go, boy, they look like they're having a great life, and mine kind of stinks. It, you, you're, you know, here, here, here they are in this perfect place, and they have one rule. Do you ever think? I, I think about this sometimes, and I go, God, I think I could keep one rule, but you know what? When I think about it a little bit longer, I think I would have failed just like Adam did. He didn't have a, a, a sin nature. He was born in a perfect person in a perfect place. But you know there's something within us. And, what, and this is what we want to talk about for a few moments here today is the weakness of man. And the truth of it is any time that God had an agreement with man and he said, here's my part and there's your part, outside of Jesus, man has always to some degree he's failed. That's why Paul says later in Romans, he says this, he says, all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God because we are flawed. We sin. We do things that are wrong. And so in, in our essence, man has a weakness. It talks about this in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 7. It actually says, just as, uh, just as um, Adam broke covenant with the heavenly father, and then all of Israel was breaking covenant as well. And this is the truth of it is man has always been at a place that we fail God. But here's the good news. God is always faithful to us. Probably if you ask me one of the great questions in the Bible, I don't know that I really have the answer to it. Um, uh, Evan does a lot of um, you know, apologetics, and maybe we can ask him later. Um, but the one thing that I don't fully understand is why did God create me? If, why did God create Adam and Eve if he knew that they were going to fail a lot of people have this question as well. Now, they come from the point of view of going, well, look at all the trouble in the world, and why did God create Adam and Eve? I look at it from the point of, like, why would you trouble yourself? And then why would you knowing? Because we know it says in Revelation 13 and 8, from the beginning, the foundations of the world, the Lamb was slain. So there was already a plan of, of redemption that was put into work. Why would you, knowing what you would have to do, to be in relationship with me, why would you ever care? And here's what you find in the scriptures is that God wants to have a relationship with you. For those of you that's sitting here, if you're watching uh, today, I want to tell you God loves you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to know you and he wants you to know him. This is a powerful understanding of what God does here. And so you know the story, Adam and Eve, they, they, they fail. They eat um, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, the Bible, God said to them that as soon as you eat the tree, you'll surely die. You know, it's not like, because sometimes we get this idea that they ate the apple like, you know, like one of the Disney stories and immediately they die. Um, it, it, it didn't happen that way. There was a spiritual death that happened. I think one of the saddest moments probably in all of the Bible is after Adam and Eve, they leave the Garden of Eden with their, son, their sons, Cain and Abel. And then the day that one son kills the other son. And there they stand with the blood of their one son that's killed and their other son is a murderer. And then they realize what they brought onto humanity. The sin, the sin that has come, that has plagued humanity. And, and this is what's true. From the time of Adam and Eve to the day that Jesus returns, we are all flawed and we have this sin nature that we have to deal with. And there is a brokenness that entered into the world. Uh, so here's God's response, and I think it's really important to see this. So whenever Adam and Eve fails, and God comes and he deals with the issues, first of all, he's crying out for Adam and Eve. Adam, where are you? You know, some people will say, 
Did, you know, did, did he not know where Adam was? Can I just say this to you? I think that, uh, that God knew exactly the tree that Adam and Eve were hiding behind, and he knew that they had sinned, and he knew what was up. I think that God knew that. But God was waiting for them to come, come clean, and what they were doing was hiding back behind the, the bushes. They were full of shame, full of guilt, full of condemnation, but God wanted them to come out, I believe, so that he could show them grace and love. And so in this moment uh, where, where you have all of this going on, what is God's response? God's response, he does a couple of things. The first thing that he does is he curses the serpent. We know what, that's the enemy. The second thing that he does is he curses the ground. Now, this is uh, especially in, poly, in apologetics. This is really important because what it speaks to is a fallen world. Why do we have disease? Why do we have death? Why do we have sickness? Why do we have supernatural disasters? Because at the fall, God cursed the ground. That was the creation of the world that we live in. It's flawed. And it says in, in uh, Romans 8 and verse 22 that one day, the, it says that all creation is groaning, waiting to be adopted. And one day Jesus will come and roll it all back and he will, he will make a fresh, new, perfect creation that we'll live in. And so we know uh, that to be true. But the, the world that we live in right now is very fallen. We have a fallen nature and we live in a fallen world. But here's the good news. You, now, there were consequences that Adam and Eve had, but what you do not find is that God does not curse Adam and Eve. He curses the ground. He curses the serpent. They have consequences. The woman has pain in childbearing. The man has to work by the sweat of his brow. So there's consequences to the sin that they had. But he, that is not what he pronounces over their life I want you to see this rather than cursing them. Go to chapter 3 and verse 15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. This is to the serpent. And between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So here's, here's the pronouncement. So he's cursed the ground. He's cursed the serpent. But now in Genesis 3.15, he proclaims what is called the Proto-Evangelium. It's the first preaching of the gospel. And what, what he's telling them is that in your fallen, broken state, I have a plan of redemption. I have already made a plan. I have already put it into effect. I believe it was the first and the last covenant. God already had a plan of redemption put into place because the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. And now he was saying to them, today, everything looks really broken. You're in a broken place, and now you're living in a broken world. But I have a promise for you, is that this serpent will certainly bruise. Uh, that seed um, will, 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 will bruise Jesus, which will means that he'll put him to death. But then your seed, the seed that comes from Eve, eventually would come from Mary, that seed will crush the head of the serpent. And when Jesus went to the cross, it looked like he was defeated. It looked like that the seed of the serpent had won. But here's the truth, and we know it today. The truth is three days later, Jesus rose from the grave and he defeated the death of pow uh, the, the power of death, hell, and the grave, and he is victorious. And so in the, in, in the weakness of man, God has this incredible plan of redemption. And so as we study over the next uh, five weeks or so, we're going to be going through and studying and looking at what that plan means. What is the plan of redemption? How does it affect your life? I would really encourage you, man, next week we're going to be, be, be talking about some really important things. And as we begin to talk about God's eternal quest, you know, there's so many books and so many series and podcasts on how we should pursue God. This is a teaching on how God has always pursued us. Because listen, if you think, I heard a guy say one time, I found Jesus. Well, Jesus was not lost, A. <laughs> and B, before you ever found Jesus, he found you. And before you ever pursued Jesus, he pursued you. And before you ever had a plan to get your life right, he had a plan to get your life right. Yeah. Because that's the love of God. There's this eternal quest of God to know you and to walk with you. And so what we're going to be going through in the next few weeks as we're starting out, I really encourage you to listen to every one of the sessions. But know this, we are going to be talking about what the difference between living under old covenant law and what it means to be a New Testament believer living by grace through faith. Listen, when, you, when this catches in your heart, it is the difference between 
uh, walking out a powerless life and being somebody who can have a powerful effect in the world that you live in because you are not living by your power, but you're living by the power of Jesus alive in your heart. Today, I want to just encourage you to know that Jesus is on the throne. And you may be in a time of brokenness today. Maybe you're here, to, you're watching today, and you go, you know, Pastor John, I got a lot of flaws, a lot of brokenness in my life. When I, when I think of Adam and Eve standing over uh, their sons, Sometimes it reminds me of my own children or my own flaws or my own past. I want to tell you today, God has a plan of redemption. He has a way through. He has a way to bring you to the other side. And so I want you to know that we love you. We're praying for you. We're going to be on this journey for the next few weeks. This concludes our teaching time. We're going to stay on, and I, I welcome you to stay on. We, we have our, some of our World Challenge family here. We're going to be asking a few questions and answering them. And so if you would like to stay tuned in, we would love to have you join us. And if not, we'll be seeing you next week. Uh, and we're going to be talking about some uh, really amazing things when it comes to the uh, new covenant in Christ and God's eternal quest to know us and to redeem us. Have a great day. And again, if you'd like to stay on, we're going to have some questions and answers. Anybody have a question about our first session? Yes, sir. Yeah, so I had a question on if if we're redeemed and we're children of God now, um, then why so much uh, struggle and so much weakness and so much struggle with sin? Sure, and which is completely true. We've been redeemed, and yet the weakness of man is still something that we encounter. You know, Paul highlighted this in Romans chapter 7 when he said, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, those things that I do. And what it highlights is that we have two natures. We have a sin nature. And still, even as believers, we still have a sin nature. That will happen until the day that we die and we see Jesus like he is and we become like him. Um, but we also have a redeemed nature. We have a God nature. And so, uh, so that is part of the wrestling that we have through this life. And, um, and, and, and here's the way that that works, is we still will, will have temptations, we'll still go through difficulties. Anybody that comes and says, I live my life and I have no temptations, no difficulties, First John <laughs> like says, anybody yeah. who says they're without, or they're without sin, much less temptation, they're a liar. I mean, he actually says, you're lying. Right. You know, he calls them out. Because we, ha we still have this weakness, mm -hmm. but we also have the redeemed nature of, the Christ, of Christ and we've been born again of the Holy Spirit. So here's, here's what happens. If you live to the old nature, man, your life and where you go and what you're doing, you'll always be causing more difficulties and troubles. As Cain and Abel, when you live to that old nature, it never brings life. But Paul says then in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, but if you live to the Spirit, there's no longer any condemnation because now you're walking in the power of, the Christ, of Christ and that new nature. So when you feed that nature and you walk with God and you know God and you put your trust in him, what happens is, is that new nature uh, comes to a place that you begin to uh, override some of those, those weaknesses of the past and will never be completely free of it. Uh, the truth is, anybody that says, uh, you know, old story from C. H. Spurgeon, uh, he had a young pastor that had come to him and he said, you know... Um, you know, Brother Spurgeon, I have been sanctified. I will never sin again. And they're sitting in this crowded restaurant, and uh, Spurgeon, uh, he takes his glass of water, and he throws it in his face. And the guy goes, hey, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Like, he's embarrassed, and all these people are watching. And C.H. Spurgeon just said, I just wanted to see how far away that old nature was. It really wasn't that far. And, it, uh, you know, it kind of highlights mm -hmm. yeah. that that old nature is still there. And to ignore it or to not know that it's there it will only bring you into maybe more frustration when you know that you have an old nature and you know you have a redeemed nature that you know that you can walk in the power and the life of Christ. It really will bring you more joy and victory. Mm, that's good. So thank thank you. you. Yes, Anna. Yeah. Um, along the lines of Adam couldn't even keep one rule um, and it really brought out the fact that we have two natures in the garden, but yet the new covenant that we read about in Jeremiah 31 that you read about in the beginning, why would God want to put his law in our minds and write it on our hearts if we can't even keep one rule? <laughs> well, because when he refers to that law, 
he was not referring to the 613 laws of the Old Testament by Moses. Otherwise, we couldn't touch, touch dead bodies and all the other things that come with the law. When he was talking about his laws, he was talking about the principles of the kingdom, the character and the nature of Christ. So he was saying that, hey, now there's a new covenant coming that I'm not just going to give you 613 laws. I am going to put my character and my nature inside of you to give you real victory and power. I'll know you and you'll know me. You'll be covered by the blood. You'll be born again of the Holy Spirit. When you begin to catch that understanding, there's really victory behind that. So it really highlights, and we're going to talk about that next week, that the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. Hey, John, I, I was talking to some people. They're talking about the innocence of babies, and we have the original sin there. Can you explain a little bit? How does that pass from gener generation to generation? Or, you know, we, we, what does this mean for, you know, why am I held accountable for maybe the first sin? Um, how does that work? And, you know, that concept of the first Adam and then Jesus as the new Adam, what, what is that, what's that all about? How does that, you know? Yeah, and, you know, I, I love this uh, passage in the Scripture. I believe it's actually in Jeremiah. It says that the, the sins of the fathers will no longer be passed down to their sons. And it, what it brings down the idea is this, is you're not really being held accountable for Adam's sin. You're being held accountable for your own sin. <laughs> and you don't, you don't really need Adam's sin to have to pay for or answer for because that what he, what he passed on to us was a sin nature because of that flaw. And so um, it, does, it doesn't mean that anybody ever has to sin. I mean, uh, especially believers that go, oh, well, the devil made me, you know, the devil can't make you do it. You still have a choice. You still have, um, you know, uh, opportunities in front of you to serve God or not serve God. Uh, unfortunately, because of the frailty and the weakness of mankind, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So you're not necessarily paying for Adam's sin it's just something that has been passed through the human race. So when you know you talk to people and they go, my parents were abusive. I came from a broken home. And hey, I, you know, I've lived through some of that. And my wife has lived through some of that. Um, you, know, you ultimately can blame your parents or you can blame their parents. But ultimately, uh, it's a fallen world and we're fallen people. And there's a lot of brokenness. And the hope that we have is that as we put our trust in Christ, and that redeeming power begins to live through us, that we overcome those things. And his forgiveness is great and real and amazing. Yes, so it Linda. seems, you know, just as I'm thinking about how God is described as he's merciful, he's a God of grace, this is his character. And just, you know, even as we are reading those passages in Genesis, it seems like those are pretty harsh consequences. Like, could he not just have forgiven them for yeah. taking a bite of fruit? I mean, it doesn't seem very significant, you know, compared to his character. Just, you know, tell me a little bit more about, you know, how those... Yeah. Why do you think he didn't just say, okay, well, we'll give you a, sec a second try, so to speak. <laughs> just one more try. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, the, and the thing is, is even now, like when we fail, we can go and ask for forgiveness and he forgives us. Um, the, tr the truth is, though, is that he was in a world that was perfect. And uh, he was in a world that the presence of God wasn't just like, you know, we have a prayer time. He actually walked in the glory and the presence of God. And in that environment, he defied God's word. And, and yes, uh, it wasn't just like one sin. I, I believe that God forgave him. I believe that one day when we get to heaven, Adam and Eve will be there. I truly believe that. Um, but the consequences of that sin it, there, wasn't, there wasn't two chances at it because that flaw, what it did is it took what was a perfect world and it introduced imperfection. And so I think that we know this, but heaven is a perfect place. And so imperfection does not make it to heaven. And now we have this big problem and Adam had this big problem because now you're no longer, you're flawed. You're no longer able to go to heaven. And so through, through this process of time, and it's what God spoke there, was I have a redemptive plan to take you in your broken places to forgive you, to put in newness of Christ, to have the forgiveness of God, and one day I'm going to restore you so that one day you can go to heaven because even with the flaws, even with the brokenness, God loves you and he wants to have relationship and he wants to bring you to heavenly places. So we'll get, we're going to be talking about a lot of that as we go through New Covenant, and I think, I really believe you'll be blessed as 
you begin to see these incredible truths out of the scripture. So do you think Jesus was plan B or do you think he knew Adam would fail? Oh no, Jesus was never plan B. Jesus is always plan A. So uh, no, it was always God knew that they would fail. He knew that they would fall. There was a plan in place. And I, I believe even before the worlds began, uh, we're going to talk more about that in session four when we talk about the new covenant between the covenant between the Father and the Son. I believe it was already an agreed to understanding. That's how you can say that the Lamb was slain but, but before the foundations of the, the world. Jesus knew that we would sin. He knew that there would be flaws. He knew that he would have to be born a man, uh, die and be resurrected on the third day to bring salvation to all that would believe in him. So it, it was already a redemptive plan. So God, nothing, you know, he's sovereign. He, he sees it all before it happens. He knows it all before it happens. And so he understood the fullness of the plan. So he, he wasn't going, my goodness, you know, the angels are in heaven. So Adam and Eve sinned, really. Like he, he knew that there would be a, a time that they would make that choice. So, um, and he already had a plan in place. Uh, to redeem us. It's actually powerful if you think about it. So, so is the, the covenant relationship, is, it, is the new covenant, is it a, a big part of it, the restoration of a right relationship with God through Jesus? Is that what's going on there? Or? It is actually, and as we go through it, you really see this, but actually what it is all about is knowing that Adam could never redeem himself, mm -hmm. that Eve could never redeem himself, and you cannot redeem yourself, and you cannot redeem yourself. And so New Covenant is all about this. How do you take flawed humanity? How do you take a flawed world? How do you take people that are sinners, that have failed and done their own thing? It says this in, it says it in, in Isaiah, everyone has gone their own way. Everyone uh, has, has been rebellious. But then God sent Jesus in Isaiah 53, you see this picture of Christ, to redeem mankind. And so God's plan was they will never be able to redeem themselves. I will come and I will redeem them from their broken state. And that is, that is the whole message of new covenant. It is the first covenant and the last covenant. So, oh, good question. If I'm redeemed and forgiven, why uh, after I've done something that I know is wrong and I, 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 I say, God, I'm sorry, why do I still feel guilty? <laughs> because you're human. You're like the rest of us. But here, here is the, I think is, this is always the truth, Jim is that um, we have God's word and we have truth, but we also have our feelings and emotions and things that we go through. And getting those things to line up where we believe God's word and we trust God's word. So there are days that we feel like, man, I really messed up with my wife, with my children at work. I feel like I've made a royal mess of things. And so sometimes we can feel like we're so far from God but if you're a child of God, you're a child of God. And I want you to really let that sink in. That like you are, you know, like I love my kids. And um, but sometimes my, kids, my children fail. But they're still my children. And um, we'll talk more about this. We actually will go towards the end. And we'll talk about the question of once saved, always saved. We're really going to deal with that in a, in a great way. Um, but without even touching that question. Even if you, even if you, uh, you know, just what, however you fall on that question, we still all have these places and times that we feel so far from God. So we have to get our emotions and our thinking and our will to line up with what God says. And when God says, I've forgiven you, he's forgiven you. He didn't forgive in part, but the whole, <laughs> you are forgiven and you stand in the presence of God Almighty. When you can see that, it really changes the whole dynamic of how you live your Christian life. And so, um, so yeah, it, it, your struggle, Jim, is real. It's for all of us. So that's a question that we all have. Join us next week. We'd love to have you back in. If you have a friend or know of somebody else, share this out. Uh, we really believe, not because I'm here or it's World Challenge, this is God's Word. We believe it's powerful and effective, and it really will encourage people. So you can share that out, and, um, and we love you dearly. Have a great day, and we will see you next week for part two.